Now, we don't have a second to spare, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in, excluding Easter. Those of you that have been around for the last six weeks, you know that we've been in a series called Recovery, where we, for about a month and a half now, have been allowing God to begin the process of setting us free from many of our hurts, habits, or hangups that are keeping us from living the life or becoming the kinds of people that Jesus has envisioned for us to become. And we've been doing this through a line-by-line study through the Beatitudes, seen in Matthew chapter 5. While all these sermons have and are going to continue corresponding with one of these Beatitudes, all these sermons have and are also going to continue corresponding with one of the eight healing principles of Celebrate Recovery, which is an addiction and recovery ministry that we actually offer here at our church on Monday nights at 6 p.m. And so since that's the case, at the beginning of all these sermons, we've been setting aside about five minutes And having someone share their testimony who's already been through Celebrate Recovery, who's applied these principles to their life, and who's seen transformation as a result. And so the lady that you guys are going to get to hear from today, not only is she a member of Overflow Worship, but she's actually been helping to lead worship for Celebrate Recovery for months and months now. And long before this series even started, she reached out to me and said, hey, at some point, I want to be able to share my testimony And I'm going to be able to talk about how important Celebrate Recovery has been to me. And so today's that day for her. So would you guys help me and welcome to the stage, Miss Kara Medina. Thank you. So hey, I'm Kara. I play acoustic for Overflow Worship, and I've been here about two years. Um, I'm totally fine with a guitar in my hand, but you put a mic in my hand, I get stuck. So I have to have notes. (laughs) Um... I'm currently in recovery from depression, grief, and trauma. My trauma branches from childhood, um, coming from my mom and her boyfriend at the time. Really rough stuff. It's tough. And um, a lot of that pain extended, like, into my adulthood. I didn't realize it, but it did. And then um, my first time in um, state's custody, I was in kindergarten, And I actually was going to get placed with my father, but um, he was a felon. Him and my mom became felons together when they shot at each other at a drop-off with me there. So they're the reason each other can't own a gun. But then after that, um, he found out what happened to me from the hands of my mom's boyfriend. And he decided to take matters into his own hands and give it back tenfold. So... When I was getting placed in foster care, my dad was on his way to the penitentiary. So that was a little different. I ended up going with my grandparents for a couple years. And I ended up back with my mom and her boyfriend after they did their anger management classes and whatnot, which was probably twice as tough because I was scared to death to say anything else because I knew that I was going to end up right back where I started. So I hate that for any child that has to go through that. It's... It's a burden to bear at that age. Fast forward a few years. Um, back then, at the age of 12, you got to choose which parent to live with. And since all that stuff was over, and I was back with my mom, I actually got to choose to live with my dad. So as soon as that age hit, I was hightailing to Tennessee where he was. The problem was, was he was more my friend and not my dad because he missed out on so many years of parenting me. It's just what he wanted to do was he just wanted to be my best friend. So... We had a blast together, fishing, hunting, racing, whatever we wanted to do. But when it came time for me to turn 18, I was clueless, had no idea how to be an adult, and I ended up pregnant a month after I turned 18 with my oldest, who's now 12. I've had three more kids since then. Don't know how I do it most days, but I love them, can't return them. They're there. So I say that so honestly. But um, not long after I had my daughter, my dad started some really odd behavior, um, more than the normal. He was bipolar. So um, some really crazy behavior. And then he had a heart attack, which it just kind of came out of the blue. And not long after that, he got even sicker and ended up in hospice between his heart and lung disease. It wasn't until he was in hospice that I found out that his heart attack was from chronic cocaine and meth use and that his dying process was probably the worst that I've ever seen, and I'm a nurse, so I've seen, I've seen some rough ones, but after the heart attack, he gave that up and went to opioids, so he felt every single 
bit of that death, and it was horrible for me and for him, and that grief lasts still today. It's a struggle because as of now, I don't have my mom around. I don't have my dad around. I'm alone. So I spent the next few years trying to figure out what to do with my life and ended up in nursing school. I was a full-time nursing school student, full-time employee, full-time mom. Zero out of 10, that was rough. And I don't know how I did it, but I do know in the middle of it, I was failing. Depression got horrible. I felt like I wasn't even worthy to be a mom to my kids. I can't pass school. What kind of example am I showing them? I can't function because I'm so exhausted. What am I here for? And I just started honestly praying just to not wake up. Maybe they were better. If this is a night, it's fine. It's okay. But I kept waking up for some reason. (laughs) And um, I had to go get my fingerprints done for nursing school. Took the opposite way to Jackson and passed overflow. And, you know, during this time of depression, I was crying and begging for my family. Why won't my mom just talk to me? Even though there's trauma, that's still my mom. Even to this day, I still text her and she doesn't reply. It's okay. But God didn't give me back that family that I was crying for because he knew better than me that that was toxic. He gave me an entire new family, an entire worship team, and now an entire Celebrate Recovery, which is cool because I can turn to any of them if I need them in a heartbeat. But um, the most valuable thing I've learned at Celebrate Recovery was you have to forgive yourself in order to forgive others. You have to forgive yourself for harboring your trauma as your own, but then you can forgive others for the trauma that they have created in your life. It's not your story, it's your history. Stories continue, history's end. It's, it's in the past, it's done. You have to close that book, and you have to start something new. Whenever you're ready, whether it's your story of sobriety, freedom, happiness, or whatever it is that you're choosing to live now, hold the community close that you found during your healing, which for me is celebrate recovery all the way. And of course, worship team, love them too. Um, but you might be the reason too that somebody else decides that it's time for them to let go and to start something new which is something that I've learned immensely in my career. Not only as a nurse, I'm a jail nurse of all things. I've seen women go from the jail that I was working in to celebrate or to Hope Center and celebrate recovery and literally do not even look like the same person. Gratitude exudes off the body and it just covers the room. It's insane. But that's my snippet of a story. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for letting me talk your head out for a few minutes and Share how I feel, and I hope one day that it is a story for you, too. I know that was wrong. I'm going to use this opportunity to once again remind some of you. Now, those of you that have been here for a while, you don't need reminding. Some of you do. So I'm going to remind you why we're taking our entire church through an addiction and recovery program that you might not think applies to every person in this room. And uh, in fact, I'm not going to remind you. I'm going to let you remind you why we're doing this. This is week six. I'm making you guys do this. So with a little bit of gusto, help me out. Uh, Say this. Say, we're all all recovering recovering from something. something. (laughs) Y'all are beating me to the punch already. We're all recovering from something. We're all struggling with something. We're all dealing with something. And for you... That's something. It might not look like a previous or current addiction to drugs or alcohol or sex or gambling, but maybe it does look like an addiction to food or social media or video games. Maybe it looks like an addiction, a deep need for approval that causes you to say yes every time someone wants you to do something, even though you know it's going to sacrifice your own happiness and your own well-being for you. Maybe that addiction, maybe you're addicted to work or to making money, or to spending money. Maybe for you, the hurt that you're struggling with is some pent-up resentment or bitterness that you're still holding against your old boss, or your ex, or your parents, or your children, or some other family member, or a friend, or the people that you used to go to church with. Or for you, maybe your hang-up is something different. Maybe it's some kind of sexual sin that you haven't told anybody about. Maybe it's anger, chronic anxiety, stress, depression, cynicism. I can't name everything, but we're all struggling with something. We're all dealing with something. We all need to experience some recovery from something. And so with that being the case, 
For the last month and a half now, we collectively as a church, we've been embracing the process of recovery through spending our time in the Beatitudes that are seen in Matthew chapter number five. So if you have your Bible, I want you to go ahead and turn real quick to Matthew chapter five so that you can read along with us. Um, We're going to start in Matthew five, three through six, and then we're going to get to verse number eight. And this is what it says. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And then verse number eight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now these verses convey truths that we have to believe if we ever want to begin experiencing freedom from our hurts, hangups, and habits that are holding us back. And all these truths can be communicated in the sermon titles for the last five weeks. And I'll remind you of these sermon titles. The first one and the R of recovery is reality check. (laughs) I'm not God. We have to accept the reality that we are not God, that we ain't got what it takes, that on our own, we are not enough and we desperately need God's help. Week two and the E of recovery, the first E of recovery is even I matter to God. You have to accept the reality that if God exists, and we believe that God exists because we're a Christian church, but if God exists, then that means he deeply cares for me and that he's more than enough, not just to change my situation, but to change me. Amen. Week number three and the sea of recovery was completely committed because as important as it is to admit that I'm not God and that I need God and to believe that God cares about me, that doesn't even matter if you're not willing to completely commit and submit yourself to God's word, God's will, and God's way. Week four, the O of recovery was open up and come clean. The biggest factor that separates people who want to experience freedom and healing from those who actually experience that stuff is the willingness to own up to your own issues, to come clean and to be willing to even confess your sin to somebody else. And then last week, the fifth sermon and V of recovery was vigilantly making some changes, vigilantly making some changes, because if we ever do want to become the people that God's called us to become, we have to remember that while it is beautiful that God himself makes us righteous, the natural response to having been made righteous is now living righteously, practicing that righteousness. But if you're ever going to practice righteousness, anyone will tell you That's going to come along with you having to make some changes to your lifestyle that are hard and uncomfortable, but worth it every single time. And that leads us to the two Beatitudes that we're going to cover today, which are in Matthew 5, verses 7 and 9. So let's go ahead and check them out. Matthew 5, 7 and 9 says this. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And since we're on the second E of recovery and the sixth healing choice of celebrate recovery, your title today is going to be this extending forgiveness and making amends. This is not going to be a super fun sermon, just so you know, extending forgiveness and making amends. And to be honest with you, while these definitely belong together, while they're connected, they are two totally different decisions. They're two totally different steps in the process of recovery. And step one is extending forgiveness. And why is that important? Well, because according to Jesus, blessed are the merciful because they are the ones that are going to be shown mercy, which is already important. But another reason why this is so important, why this step is so immensely important for your life is because I can't promise you a lot of things. I can't tell you everything that's going to happen to you, but I can, without a shadow of a doubt, unequivocally ensure you that at some point in your life, you are going to get hurt. You're going to be hurt. Somebody, you are going to feel personally attacked, personally offended. At some point, you're going to experience betrayal at the hands of a spouse or loved one or child or a family member or a friend or a coworker or someone you go to church with. You are going to suffer injustice. You're going to suffer insults. You're going to suffer heartbreak and letdown and maybe even violence at the hands of someone else. And when that happens, because it's not if, Some of that is going to happen to you. When it does, you're going to have two choices. Either number one, you can harbor lifelong feelings of hatred, resentment, and bitterness that in the long run are going to negatively affect you. Or number two, you can embrace the sometimes painful and grueling yet healing 
and liberating choice of extending forgiveness. And so for those of you that are in here and you're like, hey, I'm down to consider extending forgiveness. Maybe you're not happy about it. Maybe you're not excited about it, but you want to experience the healing and the liberation that comes along with extending forgiveness and you're up for the idea. If that's you, then like me, my guess is that your heart's going to have to be tenderized a little bit. God's going to have to soften your heart and God does that through the power of his word. In the scriptures, we are told that God's word is a hammer that breaks the rocky things to pieces. And so for just a moment, I want us to allow God to begin softening our heart through his word. And so if you have your Bibles, you can feel free to turn to Matthew 18. That's where we're going to be for just a second. We're going to read a pretty large portion of scripture. And so I want you to be able to read along and underline and make notes wherever it is that you're at. We're going to read Matthew 18, 23 through 35. But before we do, we're going to read two verses that come before it. And the first one is Matthew 18, 21. And it says this, then Peter came to Jesus and he asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times. And what you got to know is that when Peter says seven times, Peter's trying to look impressive to Jesus and to the other disciples, because at this time period in Jewish history, the Jewish religious leaders were teaching people that you only had to forgive someone up to three times, three times. You got to forgive them. But that fourth time, they're dead to you. You don't have to look at them. You don't have to speak to them. Forgiveness is off the table. And so Peter's like, dude, I'm going to double this and add one for good measure. How many times, how many times should I forgive him? Jesus seven times. You see how that could make him sound like the spiritually elite person of the group. Well, Jesus responds in a very Jesus fashion in the next verse. Y'all can throw it up on the screen. Matthew 18, 22. He says, no, Peter, not seven times. And you've got to imagine Peter's like, yes, because I wasn't really wanting to forgive him once. And Jesus continues, and he goes, no, not seven times, 70 times, seven times, which in ancient terminology is metaphorical language for you have to forgive them every single time. And then Jesus continues taking this concept and building on it in what I would call one of the more terrifying and liberating passages of the entire New Testament. And so naturally, we're going to read it. Matthew 18, starting in verse number 23, Jesus says this. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven, which is right here and right now, remind you that the second Jesus rose from the grave, he initiated the kingdom of heaven on earth. Our father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, you will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're not waiting to get to the kingdom of heaven. You're a part of the kingdom of heaven right now. You're a part of God's kingdom. So he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with his servants who borrowed money from him. And in the process, one of these servants, a debtor, was brought in who owed millions of dollars, but he couldn't pay it. And so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything that he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I'll pay it all. And that his master was filled with pity for him. And I want you to notice he didn't say, sure, I'll release you and I'll allow you to pay it back. It says he was filled with pity for him. And he released him and forgave him of his debt right then and there. Verse 28. But when that man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him just a few thousand dollars. And he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. Well, like he did just a few moments before that, his fellow servant fell down before him. And he begged for a little more time. Please be patient with me and I'll pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. And when some of the other servants saw this, obviously they were super upset. And so they went to the king and they told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man that he'd forgiven. And he said, you piece of junk, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant? Just like I had mercy on you. Then the angry king. Now that's an important word because we moved from the merciful king, the king who released him of all of his debt, the patient king, to now the angry king sent that man to prison to be tortured until he'd paid off his whole debt. In verse 35, Jesus says, and that's what my heavenly father is going to do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Now, there are two primary things that Jesus is teaching us through this passage of scripture, and the first one is this. Extending forgiveness should be a natural reaction and a regular occurrence for Christians. 
extending forgiveness should come natural to you. If you're a follower of Jesus, it shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't feel like pulling teeth. It should be natural to you. And why is that? It's because when you read this story, you're not supposed to identify with the king. It's easy to read this story and identify with the king and all the enemies that have done you wrong and you have to forgive all these enemies. You're not the king in this story. In this story, you're the servant who owed the king millions and millions of dollars and the king has now freely forgiven you of all of your debt. When Jesus died on the cross, when he died the death that you deserve because of the sins that you committed, that was God displaying the single greatest act of radical forgiveness that history itself has ever seen. And so us being recipients of that forgiveness, extending that same kind of forgiveness to the people who do us wrong, it should be easy. It should come natural. That should be the only normal thing. Why? Because those of us who have received such extreme amounts of forgiveness and mercy and love, we should be those who are best at dishing it out to everybody else. So that's the first thing. The second thing Jesus is trying to convey to us through this story is that while resentment oftentimes seems reasonable, it does, right? People do something mean to you, they're wrong to you. And I'm not just talking about someone said something mean to you. I'm talking about deep betrayal, divorce. I'm talking about murder. I'm talking about they robbed you, they beat you, they, like, they abused you, right? A lot of times, resentment and holding, holding on to it it feels warranted, but through the story, Jesus is trying to tell us that bitterness is actually just a self-inflicted prison sentence. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Think about it. It wasn't the servant's $10 million debt that got him locked up and thrown in prison. It was his unwillingness to forgive someone else of their debt that got him locked up and thrown in prison. As wonderful and as amazing as God's unmerited and unearned forgiveness and love and mercy toward us really is, your path to lasting freedom is not just you receiving God's forgiveness. It's you then extending that same kind of forgiveness to everybody else. Think about it. As forgiven as this guy was, as forgiven as he was, he refused to extend that same kind of forgiveness to other people. And in the long run, he was the one they got left in bondage. As painful as that experience was that you went through, whatever it was that happened to you, whatever they said, whatever they did, however they treated you, however they wronged you, even if they physically hurt you, as easy as it is to hold on to that resentment and that bitterness as much as we love holding on to it in here and in here, you know, the only person that your resentment is hurting is you. I've heard it said like this, bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting it to hurt somebody else. Now, that's not how poison works. If you drink poison, it's going to hurt you. Well, guess what? If you hold on to bitterness and resentment, it's not hurting anybody else. It's only hurting you. And y'all know that. Actually, you know that. You've lived it out. Let's spell it out, okay? When you're bitter and angry and resentful towards someone else, what happens? You lose sleep. You're angry. You're anxious. You talk bad about them all the time. You drink yourself to sleep because you can't get over your problems and you end up becoming an alcoholic because of what they did to you. Meanwhile, they're all right. They're sleeping good. They're making memories with their family. They're going on trips. They're working their job. They're living up to their full potential. And here you are over here getting destroyed because of your resentment because of your anger, because of what you won't let go of, because bitterness is a self-inflicted prison sentence. And that's not to downplay what they did to you. That's not to say that what they did to you was okay or wrong. Forgiveness is not you saying that the, it's not you condoning the actions of the past. Forgiveness is you making the conscious decision that the actions of the past are no longer going to determine your current reality that the actions of the past are no longer going to determine your future. Why? Because according to Jesus, holding on to that bitterness is a self-inflicted prison sentence, and the only path to your freedom is through extending forgiveness. And so we're going to talk about that here in just a second, extending forgiveness. But before we do, I think it would be important for us to talk about what forgiveness is not because we never do that at church. We only talk about how you're supposed to do it and how it's bad and it's a sin to hold on to resentment, but we never talk about what forgiveness is not. And so if you're taking notes or if you're not taking notes, 
I'll be honest, this is the one time you may take some notes because this is going to be super helpful for you in the long run. And the first thing I want you to write down concerning what forgiveness is not, forgiveness is not forgetfulness. Forgiveness does not equal forgetfulness. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Isaiah 43, 25. Isaiah 43, 25. It says, this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I remember your sins no more. Now, Christians have a rich history of using this verse to convince ourselves and to preach to other people that since God forgives and forgets, we're supposed to forgive and forget as well. But unfortunately, that's not at all what this verse is trying to convey. When the prophet Isaiah says that God doesn't remember our sins anymore, and when the psalmist says that God cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, you got to remember, that is metaphorical language talking about how God's not holding our sins against us anymore. Okay, don't be misled. God is all-knowing, and he's always going to be all-knowing. God lives in the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. He doesn't even live within the confines of time. God has never forgotten anything. God's not going to forget anything. God's not an iPhone that you can do a factory reset on. Okay, in fact, that wouldn't be forgiveness anyways. Forgiveness is not when God gives you spiritual amnesia so that you can forget all the mean and horrible and nasty things that they did or said to you. Forgiveness is when you get to the place where you can openly admit, they did me wrong. They let me down. They hurt me. I'm still trying to work through it, but I let them go anyways because that's what God's done for me. Forgiveness is not always forgetfulness. The second thing you need to know that forgiveness is not, forgiveness does not equal no consequences. Forgiveness does not equal no consequences. Even though God freely forgives us of our shortcomings, our sins still have eternal and present day consequences. Okay, let, let me give you a really easy example, and our couple from New Jersey, I believe, that's visiting. I'm not sure where you are, but I've heard that you've already experienced this on the way here, and our locals will appreciate this moment. A good example is, if you left church today and you were heading towards, say, Gleason or Martin or Dresden, and you drive through Gleason, and you decide to speed when you're going through Gleason, I don't know where the couple is, but I, I heard the story already. If you decide to speed when you're going through Gleason, and break the law and sin against God, will God forgive you for speeding? He will. But Officer Kyle Watkins may not forgive you for speeding. You may pay the price of that speeding ticket a couple of weeks from then or a couple of months from then. In the same vein, if you break relationship with someone and you treat them poorly, you may pay the price of never having the same kind of friendship with that person moving forward or if someone breaks a relationship with you and they cause you deep pain or immense grief or anger or hurt or chaos in your life, you may not need to try to have the same kind of relationship with them moving forward. You may need to establish these things called boundaries to ensure that you are healthy and you are whole and you are happy and you are full of peace. And that's OK, because forgiveness doesn't mean no consequences. And then the third thing you need to know that forgiveness is not. And this one's going to be new to some of you, and it's going to shock some of you, but it's okay. We'll talk through it. Forgiveness does not always mean reconciliation. Forgiveness does not always equal to reconciliation. Church people, more than anybody, entertain this idea that forgiving someone always means fully reconciling your relationship with that person like it was before. And while that is the case sometimes, or while that probably needs to be the case sometimes, on other occasions... Full-blown reconciliation isn't always wise, and it's not always possible. It's not possible to fully reconcile with someone if the offender still isn't willing to own up to their part in the wrongdoing. It's not wise to reconcile with someone if it had to do with sexual misconduct or abuse or deep betrayal or murder. That's not always something you're going to be able to do, and it's not always possible to reconcile with someone who's not even alive anymore. But that's okay, because you... Extending forgiveness is not contingent upon you having a face-to-face -face conversation with anybody. And you extending forgiveness isn't contingent upon you hearing an apology from anybody. 
There is but one person required for you to extend forgiveness, and that person is you. You are the only person required to extend forgiveness. In fact, let me go as far as to say, especially for our millennial and our Gen Z crowd in here who, and I am in this category, we love identifying as victims. Every part of our life is somebody else's fault. It couldn't be my fault that I struggled in school or that my relationships didn't pan out. It's my parents' fault. It's my grandparents' fault. It's the coach's fault, but it had nothing to do with me. Let me encourage you that when it comes time for you to forgive someone, you may not need to forgive them face to face. And this is why for some of you, the only motive you have behind getting in front of someone face to face and offering your forgiveness to them is because really you just want them to feel the pain that you've experienced. That's not forgiveness. That's you taking revenge. You may not need to say, look, if you're trying to forgive your parents, I say forgive because you're not trying to forgive your parents. You're trying to make them feel bad. If you're trying to forgive your parents for something that happened 20, 30 years ago and you just drop a bomb on them out of nowhere. That isn't going to be productive for you and it's not going to be kind to them. So you don't always need to bring it up face to face. And another reason is because a lot of times in the heat of the moment, when you start thinking about those things, your emotions begin changing and you stop remembering the part that you played in it. And then you bring it up face to face and suddenly tension where there wasn't any tension before begins to arise. And so you don't always need to forgive people and remind them why it is you're forgiving them because of this awful thing that they did. You don't need to do that face to face. And there are lots of different techniques that you can use so that you don't have to do this face to face. The first one is what we'll call the chair technique. That's not a cool title for it, but it is, it is what it is. And you'll understand what that is. Uh, one time as a youth pastor, I had a family who moved to our city and all their kids started coming to our youth group and they were super involved and their family was super impressive. And sometimes the longer you're in ministry, you know when other people have been in ministry because you hear the way they talk, you see the way they do things and you're like, oh, you get it. You've been in this thing. And so we knew that was the case. We just didn't know to what extent that was. But come to find out, the girl sits down with my wife, Samantha and I, one time and she opens up to us and she says, she begins telling us why they moved there from eight hours away. And it was because her dad, who was the pastor at their church, their entire lives growing up, got caught having an affair on their mother who had cancer at the time. Like, you can't come up with the tougher story. That's just rough, dude. That's intense. And so she began telling us this. And she was like, I'll be honest with you. I want to love my dad, but I feel like I hate him right now. They made me move and I've lost all these friends and I love my dad, but I'm also disgusted with him and I can't look at him and I don't want that. I don't want that on me. I want to have a great relationship with him. And so we introduced her to the chair technique and I'll tell you what it is through how she did it. She grabs a chair. She takes it into her garage one night after youth group, after we were telling her, and this is how it works. You imagine whatever person that you're trying to forgive sitting in that chair. You do not go into your house you don't call them up and ask them to come sit in the chair. You imagine that they're sitting in the chair. And so she's imagining that her dad's sitting in the chair. And she lists out, out loud, all her grievances against him. You did this, and you did this, and this is how it made me feel, and this is what I'm going through. She was allowed to air all of her lived experiences and everything that she struggles with. And then when she gets to the end, she has to repeatedly say, but I love you, and I forgive you, because God's forgiven me. So I forgive you too. And she does this for like an hour and a half. And for a while, it kind of felt empty. It didn't feel like much was happening. And then the Holy Spirit just showed up in the garage. And she has this encounter with the love and power of God. She has this moment where she's crying. Her dad's not even there. He's in the house. But she's crying. She has this moment with God. And she walks back in. And her and her dad's relationship was reconciled from that day before. It was super cool. So that's one approach that you can take so as to not have that conversation face-to-face. -face. Another approach is that we'll just call writing a letter. Uh, again, not a super cool title, but it's what you do. You write a letter to the person that you need to forgive. And again, you list out, you go through everything that happened. You talk through everything that they did, how it made you feel, how it hurt you. And then consistently you say, but I choose to forgive you. I love you. I let you off the hook because that's exactly what God's done to me. And you know what you do with that letter? You don't give it to them. You crumble it up and you throw it away or you burn it or you get rid of it or something like that. And I know that some of you are like, you're not feeling this already because you're like all this freely given forgiveness 
You know what it feels like? It feels unfair, doesn't it? You know why it feels unfair? Because we want them to feel the pain of what they put us through. We want them to. We want our parents to know how bad they hurt us. We want our ex to know what they put us through. We want those friends to know that their words that we found out that they were saying behind us threw us into depression. We want them to feel that. But you want to know what you're truly what the Lord maybe wants to say to you right now? Relax. Let him be God and you be a follower of Jesus. You know who God is? God's the righteous judge, not you. God brings justice, not you. God makes everything right. He makes every wrong right. He doesn't need your help. He does that. He takes care of that. And one day we're all going to have to answer for every word that came out of our mouth, for every action. That we, and, and in that day, if it doesn't happen sooner because you reap what you sow, in that day, everyone's going to have to answer for it. It may be time for you to relax and let God do what God is supposed to do. And you know what you're supposed to do? As a follower of Christ, you're supposed to emulate Christ on the cross. Who gets nailed to a cross because of what we were doing, gets wronged in every way possible, and it says he uttered not a word. He said nothing. In fact, he says one thing. Do you want to know what he said? Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. That's your job. You relax. You let God do what God's supposed to do. And you embrace the process of forgiveness. And when you're embracing the process of forgiveness, you have to remember that that's exactly what it is. It's a process. It's probably not going to happen immediately. Maybe it does. Maybe the Holy Ghost meets you right on a Sunday morning and suddenly you have nothing to hold against anybody and you're totally free and ready to go. My guess is that it's going to require a little bit more than that. It's going to take some time. It may not happen overnight. And you may have to actually do what Jesus says. You know, he says, forgive 70 times seven. I think sometimes, and this is probably how you're supposed to read this, right? God demands that we forgive people 70 times, seven times. You know, another truth though, sometimes you're going to have to forgive people 70 times, seven times before that forgiveness ever becomes a reality in your heart and your mind. You're going to have to do it over and over and over and over. And if that's the case, do it. Commit yourself to it. Why? Because blessed are the merciful, for they are the ones that are going to be shown mercy. And you want to know how extending that kind of radical and unwarranted mercy can become a lot easier for you? Remembering the fact that as many people have hurt you, you have also hurt plenty of other people. You don't just get to identify as a victim. You are the offender. This is why we can't stop at just extending forgiveness. Why? Because that makes us constantly feel like a victim. If you're the only one extending forgiveness and you've done nothing wrong, no, it's why we have to take the next step, which is making amends. Because more than you've probably ever realized it, you have caused other people deep pain and hurt. And in light of God's grace toward us, as followers of Jesus, we have to be becoming more and more self-aware of when that happens. We have to be willing to then extend forgiveness to those people. And why is that? Because blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And recognizing when we cause other people pain and then humbly noticing and admitting that it happened and doing whatever it takes to fix it, that is practically what making peace looks like. He doesn't say blessed are the peacekeepers. He says blessed are the peacemakers, people who work for it. And that is what working for peace looks like. But here's the problem. Saying the phrase, and our married people in here will identify with this. Saying the phrase, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, please forgive me. Is there anything I can do to make up for it? That is the hardest phrase that ever comes out of your mouth as a married person or as a person in general. I mean, how many of you in here hate that moment when you're fighting and you have to own up to your wrongdoing and your temper tantrum and your selfishness? You want to know why we hate saying I'm sorry? Because we're selfish and we're prideful and we're hard headed and we disdain the thought of being wrong. We hate it. And so exercising the humility required to offer a sincere apology and to ask for forgiveness is really tough sometimes. But if you ever 
on your life, your marriage, your relationships, your friendships, your church, your workplace, to be defined by the healing and the freedom and the liberation that comes along with forgiveness and making amends, you're going to have to be someone who chooses at some point to finally see through the lens of someone else, to notice where you've made a mistake, and then to say, what can I do to fix it? It's not enough to apologize. You then have to figure out, what is it that I need to do to make this right? Now, let me show you a verse that we don't read very often. This is uh, another one of those verses that's like, wow. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. This is Jesus speaking. He says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar. Now, let's pause right there. You're offering your gift at the altar. That's strange language because we live in 2024 and we're talking about Old Testament Jewish customs right here. You know what he's saying? If you're at a worship service, if you're making a sacrifice, offering a gift back in the day, that is you engaging in worship. So he's saying, therefore, if you show up on Sunday at 1240, well, you're here at 1245. I'm sure the worship service was going on at about 1135, if I'm not mistaken. If you show up at 1135 and you're in the middle of a worship service and you remember, like, let's, let's keep reading. You remember that your brother or sister has something against you, meaning that you've done something to them. Leave your gift there at the altar, meaning stop worshiping, stop singing the song, stop acting like everything's okay and go and be reconciled to them and then come back and offer your gift. Then come back and keep worshiping. Then come back and keep seeking God once you've done your part in making things right. But do that first because God isn't like, doesn't really want our worship if we're not even willing to go be reconciled with people that we've done wrong. He's like, no, I don't want it. That's your worship. Go do that. And again, if you're married, my guess is that you've had that moment time and time again where you show up on a Sunday morning and you viciously screamed at each other the night before or on the way to church if you're young or you have kids and you're about halfway through the second song and Carl is singing and the Holy Spirit's there and you can't figure out why in the world you can't feel God and then you realize, oh my goodness, I've been such a jerk and I spoke to her like that and I didn't ask for her forgiveness and the Lord is like, hey, and so you nudge her or you nudge him. He said, like, baby, I'm so sorry. Uh, that fight today was dumb and it shouldn't happen. And then they look at you and they go, it's okay. I love you so much. And then you keep worshiping. You had that moment, right? So my guess is that outside, isn't it great? Man, I love seeing your faces. I wish you had the opportunity to see your faces because y'all ain't even got to say, hey, man, that's good. Because I could, y'all, people sitting out there going, <laughs> nudging each other right now. Because y'all all know that that happens. Maybe it's with your spouse. Maybe it's with your kids. But this is my guess. My guess is that that's the only time you've ever really done anything like that, right? The only time you've stopped worshiping and made things right with someone is when it was like your spouse or your kid. But my assumption that I feel like is based on pretty good lived experience is that very few of you have ever stopped uh, singing during a worship service or serving on a team or helping or giving or whatever and walked out in the lobby and called someone and said, man, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. My guess is that it, it kind of stops with us and our spouse. And I've got one story of how I have had to leave my gift. I've had to go make amends with someone before I continued worshiping God and, and serving God and, and it being literally on a Sunday morning. It was about a year and a half ago. and It was in a weird season because it was three weeks removed from my wife and I having a miscarriage. And so we were already dealing with some emotions that we didn't really know how to handle at the time. On top of that, I was preaching a sermon about giving and generosity, which in case you've never been told this, pastors don't like talking about that at church because people aren't super forgiving. Uh, the very same people that thank you so much for baptizing their child and talking about forgiveness, you start talking about how they need to put their money where their mouth is and not be greedy and give or whatever, suddenly you're a celebrity health and wealth preacher who only wants their money because you want a helicopter. And none of that's even true. It's crazy, but people don't like hearing about it. And so it's stressful. We have to get up here and do that sometimes. And so not only have we gone through the miscarriage, not only am I talking about money, but now in the sermon, like in the moment, I am going over time. I am preaching too long. And the reason that's a problem is because that puts all of our other teams at a disadvantage. That creates a lot of stress and chaos with kiddos check out and our guest team and our worship team. They can't get a break and go get water, whatever, all that different stuff. And so I know that I'm not supposed to do that if I want to honor their time. And so our production director, Daniel Howell, like he should have, there's a little TV back there and he projects up on the TV, just a little sign that essentially read, please hurry, 
you're going over time. It wasn't anything mean. It was just, please hurry, you're going over time. And the only issue that day is that there wasn't a clock that I could see on that back screen, so I didn't know I was going over time. So it was the first time that I realized it. So I get real frustrated in the moment. Check this out. So frustrated. And if y'all been coming to the 1130, you weren't here for this. So frustrated that out loud in front of the congregation, I said, thanks production team for the sign back there. Let me know that I'm going over time. I'll wrap it up, but could you take it down? It's distracting me. <laughs> so it's like, wow, I can't believe I did that. It gets worse. I get done with the sermon. I walk back to the production booth and I chew Daniel out in front of the whole team. It was not a shining moment for me as a pastor or as a friend. And I knew that. And afterwards I left the production booth. This is at the 8 a.m. So I have two more to go after this. So I'm sitting back there. I walk back to the back and literally the 945 starts like one minute later because I did go that long. And I sat my face in my wife's lap and I cried for the next 40 minutes until that video started. And then I got up here and I preached because in my mind, one, I knew I was dealing with some emotions that I wasn't used to. Two, I was stressed about preaching about money. But three, now I was embarrassed because I'd spoken to Daniel in a way that he for sure didn't deserve to be spoken to. And I had to get up here and preach two more times after that. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And so the whole time I'm preaching at the 945, I'm just going, I know what the Holy Spirit's saying. He's like, you know what you're going to have to do. You know what you have to do. You can't be that guy who says, well, you're the pastor and you can say whatever you want to say. He's like, are you going to be that guy? And I'm like, oh, but I couldn't do it. With everybody else around, so I have to wait. I have to navigate my way through the sermon. Worst sermon I've ever preached in my whole life. Sorry if you were here for it. Get done with the sermon. And I immediately walked straight back to the production booth. And in front of everyone that heard me say it the first time, I apologized to Daniel for my tone, for my attitude. And I made sure that everyone on the production team knew that that was not behavior that is ever acceptable, one, from a pastor, but two, from a friend or from a Christian at all. And Daniel, because he is awesome and he loves God and he loves me, he immediately forgave me. And I'll tell you what, he's never brought it up a single time after that. And we have an amazing relationship now. And that's not where me making amends stops. I've met, had to make amends with family members, with my parents, with my wife plenty of times, with my other colleagues. But now that I've put myself on blast, the question is, who do you need to make amends with? Who do you need to apologize to? Who is it that you need to have a conversation with? Depending on your age, your walk of life, it could look different. For some of you students, maybe it's that teacher that you treat like garbage every day. You talk in her class or his class. You never listen. Maybe it's the way you disrespect your parents. You need to go apologize to them for the way that you've been acting. Maybe for you parents, you need to apologize to your kids for not being there when they grew up, for not making them a priority, for spending more time at the golf course than you did their own games. Or maybe it's because of how you physically or verbally or emotionally or spiritually abused them growing up. For some of you, it's your spouse that you cheated on, that you lied to, that you haven't been intentional with, that you haven't said thank you for being such an awesome spouse, for raising our kids, for working so hard, and you just nag or you just complain to one another. You just point out the things that they do wrong. Maybe it's time to apologize. For, for others of you, maybe it's a friend or a family member that you put through hell because of your addiction or because of your workaholism or because of your selfishness. Either way, if we ever want to become the kinds of people and live the kind of life that God has envisioned for us, you have to do the work of mending the relationships that you broke. If you broke it, guess whose job it is to fix it? Yours. You have to ask for forgiveness. You have to make amends. But here's the thing. It's one thing to say, go make amends. <laughs> it's a whole other thing to actually go and do it. So let me give you five quick tips for those of you that are ready to do this, that are ready to experience the kind of healing and the freedom and the life that comes through obeying God, through extending forgiveness and making amends, the first thing that you're going to need to do when it comes to making amends is, number one, make a list of everyone that you need to make amends with, because it ain't just your spouse. Make a list of whoever it is that you need 
to go and apologize to. And if that feels daunting or overwhelming because there's so many people on there, breathe. If God asks you to do something, he's going to give you the grace to do it. You can do it. Make the list. And if that feels impossible because you're like, I just, I'm not sure that I've ever done anyone wrong. And I'm not sure that I need to apologize to anyone. Well, then, then repent for your selfishness and your pride and ask God to teach you what it means to be humble because, sweetheart, you're not just a victim. You are the offender on some level to somebody. So figure out, make a list. Who, who is that? Number two, consider your timing. It's not always the right place and the right times to make amends with someone. The supermarket, probably not the right place and the right time. Immediately following church when there's four trillion people out in the loudest lobby that's ever existed in mankind. Probably not the right time or place to try and make amends with somebody through a text message. Probably not the right time or way or place to try and make amends with someone. You, it, it's, you don't get to make amends with someone on your timing. You have to do it with what works best for them. So take them into consideration. And when you do, your third thing that you're going to want to keep in mind is to check your attitude when you do it. How would you want someone to apologize to you? It's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How would you want it? My guess is that you'd want it done in private. My guess is that if someone was going to apologize to you, you'd want them to have a demeanor that screamed humility, right? My guess is that if someone's going to apologize to you, you'd want their tone to be really kind and really patient and really caring and understanding. You know what you don't get to do as we're talking about checking your attitude? You don't get to justify your actions. All you get to do is own up to your wrongdoings. You know what's not an apology? Well, it's an apology. It's not one that works. You want to hear it? Well, I'm sorry, but if you hadn't have... Nah, how many times have you said it? How many times have you been there? That, that's not an apology that works. You have to own your wrongdoings, and you can't justify your actions, and then you have to go in with zero expectations. You don't get to assume that they have to act some type of way just because you apologize. You're not apologizing so that they'll be happy with you. You're not apologizing so that they'll be friends with you. Again, you're apologizing because it's the right thing to do. That's it. You don't get to determine how they respond to your apology. You just get to apologize because you love God and because it's the right thing to do. So you got to check your attitude. Number four, in the process of making amends, you have to be appropriate. It, not every person that you could make amends with should you make amends with. Okay, for example, if it's an old boyfriend or an old girlfriend that's now remarried, yeah, probably don't DM them on Facebook Messenger saying, I'm so sorry for what I put you. They don't want to hear from you and they don't need to hear from you. Don't contact their family. Don't show up at their church. Don't like, if they come to the eight o'clock, go to the 1130. You know what I'm saying? Like, there are moments where it's not super appropriate, and so you're going to have to consider that, and you don't know a good way to consider whether or not it's appropriate for you to make amends. Get like four or five people that you trust, your family members, and ask them to be honest with you. Your accountability partner, your friends. Like, should I do this? Because sometimes we get ideas in our head that sound really good in our head, but then when we say it out loud in front of other people, we go, oh, that, that probably isn't very smart. So do that. Be appropriate, because it's not always appropriate for you to even make amends, but that's okay. Put an invisible person in a chair in front of you <laughs> and make amends with them. That's fine. And then the last part of making amends is what we're going to call restitution. If you owe someone money, pay it back. If you made someone a promise or a commitment that you didn't follow through with, follow through with it and get it done. You know, that's a part. That's like a natural result of having an encounter with Jesus. Did you know that? That restitution is a natural response of having an encounter with God. Let me, let me remind you, you know the story of Zacchaeus? I probably, many of you grew up in church. You heard the story of Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in that sycamore tree to see what he could see. Right? Zacchaeus, he's a scumbag tax collector. He's a Jew who's stealing money from other Jewish people so he can get rich. And Jesus decides to go have lunch at Zacchaeus' house. Do you remember the end of the story? He has one encounter with the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. And what was his initial response? 
he went and restored back four times everything that he had stolen. Why? Because restitution, it is a natural response to having an encounter with God. And to be fair, there are certain things you're not going to be able to restore. You can't restore everything that you've done, but do not sleep on the power of a sincere apology. Don't sleep on the power of saying, I am so sorry. I was wrong. I know I hurt you. Please forgive me. And is there anything that I could do to make this thing right? Don't sleep on the power of that because that right there can be just enough sometimes to win someone back. And I know that this was not like a sermon where you're like built up in your faith and you're ready to go run a marathon and God is awesome and I feel awesome right now. You might not feel awesome right now. I told you a couple of weeks ago that the rest of this series was going to be surgery. And I told you that it was going to get tougher and tougher and tougher. And I'm not apologizing for that. Why? Because around here, we're into this thing called becoming Christians. We're, we're becoming Christians. We are living the life. And you know what Christianity is? It's embracing life change. It's embracing transformation, even when transformation is tough. And as we're talking about forgiveness, is there a single trait that is more defining to Christianity than forgiveness? If so, name one. It is the highest priority of our entire belief system. And so today, we're not cutting any corners. I want to invite those of you who are ready to begin the process of extending forgiveness and making amends. But before we do, I want to invite you to stand up on your feet. And when you stand up, if you have a notebook and a pen or a pencil, keep it in your hands. And if you have your phone, go ahead and get it out. Turn it to the notes section. I'm going to give you some action responses this morning. We're turning into Alex Gallion's youth group all over again. This is why we're doing it. I already know what you guys have been trained to expect when it comes time for response. I already know what it is because I'm the one who did it to you. You're trained to expect that in the sermon, somewhere along the way, I'm going to hit a bypass that turns the sermon into, if you need to make a fresh start with God for the first time or for the first time in a long time, if you need to make a rededication of your faith or you need to get saved, then I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. And if you need to do it, do it. If you need to repent of your sins, place your faith in Jesus, be saved. By all means, do it. I'm just not going to lead you through that prayer this morning. But good thing is you don't need me to lead you through that prayer. You can do it. But the issue with that moment sometimes is that that doesn't apply to most people in this room. If you're serving God and you're a Christian, you know what that moment turns into? It turns into you just repeating that prayer because everybody else is, and you sleeping through that last minute of the song that we sing. But today, rather than singing a song for the sake of singing a song or going through a fresh start moment just because that's what we always do, today, I want to provide you with some practical responses to this message because the goal is not you hearing a good sermon about forgiveness and making amends today. The goal is that you would leave from this room and go extend forgiveness and make amends with someone. And so this is how we're going to respond to the message. Here in a moment, we're all going to pray a prayer out loud. I'm going to have you repeat the prayer with me. And then I'm going to give you 45 seconds of silence and reflection to simply ask God, Lord, who is it? that I need to forgive? Who is it that I've been holding grudges against? Who am I resenting? Who do I need to forgive and how does it look? What do I need to do? Do I need to do the chair thing? Or do I need to write a note? Do I need to do something else? And then we're gonna take about 45 seconds and I'm just gonna let you listen to the Holy Spirit and figure out what it is he's asking you to do. And you can hear from the Holy Spirit if you're a Christian. You may hear from him through a picture that he places in your mind, through a knowing in your conscience that you can't shake. But I'm going to give you a second to listen. And then we're going to pray another prayer. And we're going to begin asking God who it is that we need to make amends with. Who do I need to apologize to? Who do I need to own up to concerning commitments that I made that I didn't fulfill? Maybe it's a spouse or a friend, a coworker, someone you go to church with, a parent, a child, someone else. God, who is it? And what does me making amends practically look like? What do you want my attitude to look like? What do you want my words to sound like? What do you want me to say? What if, if I need to make restitution? How do I need to make restitution? And I'm going to give you a second to write it down. 
So, if that's what you're ready for today. Now, if you're just here because you have to be at church, then just close your eyes and sleep through the next few minutes. But if you're ready, yeah, some of y'all laugh, but that's, I know, the, I know that feeling. I've been there. I've been that person. But if you're ready to begin the process of being set free from some of this stuff, stepping into the life that God has for you and obeying God, then do me a favor, close your eyes, and I want you to pray this with me. Jesus, thank you for forgiving me from all my sins. Teach me and give me the grace to do the same for everyone else. Holy Spirit, highlight anyone and everyone that I need to start forgiving and teach me how to actually do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Take 45 seconds. You can keep your eyes closed. Just let the Holy Spirit speak to you and write it down when he does. All right, now pray this with me. Holy Spirit, show me anyone who I've hurt, who I've let down, who I've wronged. Teach me how you want me to make amends. I'm willing and ready to do whatever needs to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Take 45 seconds. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Write it down. All right, we've prayed. We've written it down. The next step is you telling someone else about it. You need to tell someone or it's not, you're not going to do it. You need to be held accountable. And then the next step, just for the real ones, go do it. Go have the conversation. Go extend the forgiveness. And the beautiful part is that when you say yes and you obey God to do something that he tells you to do, he gives you the grace to do it. So one last time, do me a favor with eyes closed and hands up, hands up all over the room as a sign of surrender. Lord, we surrender to your call to extend forgiveness and make amends. We're done watching church. We're done singing songs. We're ready to be Christians. We're ready to experience life change and transformation. And we know that you're going to give us the power to do that. Holy Spirit, teach us what it means to forgive. Help us to forgive. Teach us what that process looks like and thank you in advance for your patience as we say yes to embracing it. And God, we pray that you'd shine a light and reveal any area where we need to make amends. Help us to become self-aware. God, we thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for the grace that you're gonna give us to obey you. And we say yes to that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen and amen. One time, can we just thank God for caring about us, for transformation? Jesus, we love you. Overflow. I love you. You're dismissed. You guys have a great afternoon, man.